Hi, Matt Sperling. I'm the editor in chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Gadge Panasar from Siemens EDA, who's going to talk today about optimizing AI systems. Gadge, when you take a look at AI systems, there are there's a whole range of these devices in terms of what they're trying to do, where they're going to be located. What sort of problems are you starting to run into in terms of optimization? Well, many of them just, um, come from systemic complexity. And they're pretty complex beats, these AI systems. And they all have different architectures. Uh, some are, are bespoke, some take off the shelf CPUs and interconnects and have accelerators. Um, the main problems come down to the inherent complexity of the, those chips. So things like loss of performance, uh, CPU performance, deadlock, loss of uh, outliers, for example, maybe the amount of time it takes for particular transactions to complete, orchestrating work to be carried out in accelerators or vector engines or the like. All that added together is main contributing factors to, the, to performance loss in, in such systems. Let's dig into this. Sure. Gadge, what are we looking at here? So let's take a, an example AI or ML SOC. This is a, an obfuscated high level block diagram of one of our customers' chips. And I was going to run through some of the problem areas and how on chip monitoring or introspection monitors will help with understanding of what's going on with a view to providing data such that you can help optimize the, the software executing on these systems. What I want to talk through is, by way of an example, is use a, a high level block diagram of one of our customers' SOCs in the ML AI space. And as you can see here, there's a, a bunch of different kinds of cores, some bare metal machines, some uh, OS capable cores, vector cores, accelerators, security enclaves, DDR controllers, and tying all this together is, is a, a NOC, a network on chip. And Gadj, when, when you look at this design and this architecture, it's really a lot of data that's moving around here. You have to make sure that whatever you're trying to extract from this can be able to move through this fairly easily without being disrupted, right? Absolutely, that, that's the key thing here. The, the data flows of the, the, the system itself, the data flows will have some effect on each other's data flows. What we want to do is make sure whatever we use to understand the behavior of the system doesn't affect the target system's behavior, because otherwise you suffer from Heisenberg's principle, and we do not want to do that here. This is much more difficult in an AI chip though, right? Because you think about an AI chip, the whole goal here is to maximize the uh, flow of data and to uh, really utilize the processors as much as you possibly can because you've got so many different processing elements and memories all scattered all around here. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think the only way to do this is to ensure that you have sufficient introspection monitors that not intrusively provide information at runtime to some sort of analyzer. Now the analyzer could be either on chip or it could be off chip. We have a class of customers who take the data that our monitors will generate and they will chew on that in the chip to then feed back to say the scheduler of the workload and to adjust it accordingly. So when you're a design team trying to work with this design and trying to figure out how to troubleshoot it along the way, what goes wrong? Well, you know, as soon as you put things like caches in, the system is unpredictable. And you have many of those things happening at the same time. And they're all contending for shared resource, things like the memory controllers and the interconnect. So things that go wrong are unknown behavior of the caching system because you, in, in, the, in the case of iCache, you, you've missed and you haven't got that in, in, in the core, so you have to go and fetch it at the same time as something else is accessing 
the, the memory, uh, as well as accessing the NOC itself. And then behind the scenes, you have all things like snooping going on. Your memory can, system is snooping from one process to another. So whilst your data flow, you, you may have high level view of what's going to happen. Behind the scenes, there are lots of other things going on that are not necessarily obvious at design time. What happens there is that at integration time and system bring up, that's when you see these problems because you miss the cache, you cause more traffic on the interconnect, while some other cores are snooping into your cache, your local cache system, then that has effect on the knock and the, the traffic coming out of your, your cores. So you've got partitioning, you've got prioritization, and you've got dependencies that you're wrestling with here, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and they all together create, create a, a non-deterministic system. So you can't sit down on, and draw a bit of paper and say, well, this will affect this. When, when you have things like system dependencies, such as caches and, and uh, accelerators finishing at different times, then time at which these things interact changes depending on the workload. So how complicated does this really get? Let me show you. Um, the short answer is it can get very complicated, but with some initial analysis of where you want to put these introspection monitors, they don't have to be too complicated. So here is our customer's chip with Siemens um, embedded analytics monitors in place. Let me just run through some of what the monitors do. So uh, these bus monitors, they're transaction aware and protocol aware monitors observing traffic going across the interconnect into the lock. These can be configured at runtime to provide information on certain uh, transactions in flight. So for example, we can get this bus monitor to look at transactions from say the data cache or the iCache going into the lock, going to say the memory controller, we can provide information such as, this is how long the transaction took, this is how many transactions are in flight, this is how many iCash misses took place in this window of time, and so on. And we have things like the status monitor here, which is looking at the internal signals of the accelerator, which will do things like give you information on how often the accelerator is being loaded with tasks to, to, to chew on, um, and then we have things like monitors inside the NOC itself to provide information on things like what the token usage is of the, the resources within the NOC. So it gets even more complicated than this, right? It, it can do, but the, the point is that these monitors are runtime configurable. And so you can configure them in situ while the system's running to provide different kinds of information. So I'll tell you what, let me run through some examples to just explain how this would operate. Oh, and before I do that, all these monitors are tied together, and I will only show this once, tied together with a, its own message passing fabric so that we're not using any of the resources of the NOC. Here, let's take this example. In this case, we configure this bus monitor. So in this case, these are AXI connections to the NOC. These are, no, these are knocked connections to the knock. But let's take this AXI monitor <clears throat> and we configure it to do things like do min max average calculation of the transaction time for iCash misses. What matters in this case is not the minimum or the average, it's the maximum time because it's these outliers that will affect the behavior of the overall operation of the system. And so we can configure this bus monitor runtime to provide information so that you can plot a graph like this if you wanted to. And we can see the max duration time and the average duration time. And you can see there's quite a difference. And we can also know, because the bus monitor will also give you the timestamp when these things happened, you can correlate when these large transactions took place with time 
And then you can correlate that with the work that the system was doing. And you can ensure you can try and reduce that time by rescheduling the work elsewhere. Can this be optimized by the AI system itself, or do you have to actually build this into the software that you're running the entire system with? It's a very good question, Ed. Um, so the monitors are autonomous, they're run by themselves, but we have ways of something, one or more CPUs inside the chip to configure and take the data and then feed that information back to say, the orchestrator of the AI system. So under the hood, um, what happens in terms of the system trying to figure out what's happening with all the different uh, pieces of data that you're trying to put together here? It really depends on the partitioning of your software and the data. So let's look at another example. And this time we're configuring these mock monitors. So mock monitors from the scalar processor and the two vector processors. And what we're doing here is looking at decast traffic, but also looking at the snoop traffic from the knock snoop traffic. Um, and what you can see is by observing the, this data that you can see CPU one is seeing a lot of snoop traffic from CPU zero compared to the other CPUs. This tells me that the data being used by this, th this processor should be more here rather than here. So if you partitioned it better, you wouldn't see the snoop traffic. You wouldn't see more traffic in the interconnect. You wouldn't see um, impact of decached traffic being held back because the, there isn't enough bandwidth through the knock. You think about an AI system, one of the key pieces of this is there's a lot of memory that's being used here. Not all of it is, is perfectly optimized a lot of times. How do you solve that? Well, the way we solve that is we provide the information for the system designer, the system software guy to solve it. What we do is provide data. So let me, let me give you this example. Here, we, we are looking at traffic, bandwidth traffic into these two DDR controllers. And what we're looking at, we configure this, this bus monitor to do min max average in windows of time. But when that window of time expires, those three count values are sent to the analyzer. And when that window of time expires, it restarts and does the counting again. And what you can see in this window of time, the four CPUs that we're looking at are, are sending transactions to that DDR controllers at the same time. This means you're seeing several gigabytes worth of transactions going to that DDR controller. Um, and here we're just looking at those four processes. You know, things like accelerators and DMAs will also be going in there, which means that in that window of time, you're seeing an awful lot of accesses which may swamp that DDR controller. So what we can do here, we provide that information to the analyzer. We know when these min-max averages happen, which is, these things are timestamped, and then, then this could be fed back into the, the uh, system software to reschedule those transactions. What this also allows you to do is be able to say, this is the normal pattern, this is what we see, but there's also, if you have an anomaly in here, what's causing that? Is it a breakdown in the circuit? Is it a security breach? You have all those different parameters that you can start measuring, right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, the, this is about optimization, but, but the other usage of this is to look for safety and security issues. And a lot of that is based in, in my, uh, in, in the research that we're doing is based on patterns. If the pattern is the same always, you, you know that you design the system to that pattern. But when that pattern changes, either through open the, over the air updates or because someone has managed to download some, some software onto your processors, you can detect that change in patterns and then provide that information to something that can, that can provide a way of preventing or 
changing those that, that condition. Another factor that you have to consider in these chips is that these are really very heterogeneous designs. In the past, you would have a, a single processor or maybe multiple processors. They pretty much be the same processor. Now you have all these different accelerator chips. You've got different uh, uh, types of memory. How do you work with all those different elements? What do you have to keep in mind? Again, a very good question, Ed. Um, the way we would propose it is, let's take this example. Uh, again, we have different monitors for different types of things. Uh, let's take, in this particular case, look at this vector engine. We have, uh, take this processor trace module that we have, and this status monitor, which is observing the internal signals of this accelerator. What we can do there is correlate the execution. So in this case, the processor trace module is running in what we call cycle accurate mode. So we can see the amount of time each instruction is taking to complete. And we can compare that with work elsewhere. So we know in this case, the vector engine is pushing stuff into the accelerator to do work. And then that result comes back and the vector engine continues work. And what we can do is by having the processor trace um, running cycle accurate mode, we can look at how long each instruction has taken to complete. And here we can see this particular instruction has taken 2,000 cycles to take, complete, whereas most of the others are insignificant. And what we can do here, when we see this cycle accurate trace module detecting a, a value above a certain number, we can cross correlate with the information the status monitors generate. And you can see the workload that the accelerators are, have, they're, they're pretty deterministic, except here. And this is because this, data, this accelerator has been fed too much data without the previous one being finished. And this is stalling this vector engine because it's waiting for that particular work to be completed. Gadge Panasar, as always, thanks for a really interesting conversation. Thank you very much, Ed. I really enjoyed our interaction today.